Hey, my name's Matt. I'm part of the team here at South Point Church where you're usually one church in multiple locations, but because of the weather, we get to be one church in one location this morning. So glad that you made it out here. Hey, we have a little saying here that we say pretty regularly at South Point, and at the start of the new year, I want to make sure that we say it and don't forget it. And it goes something like this. At South Point, we really don't care why you're here. And here's why. Because South Point is a place that you can come as you are. And here's the good news. None of us have to to stay that way. And at South Point, we don't care where you've been because we believe the great news is, is God is more concerned about where we're going. And lastly, at South Point, we don't care what you have done because we think the greatest news in all of eternity is my life, your life, our life doesn't have to be defined by what we have done, but instead by what Jesus already did on the cross. So we want you to hear one thing this morning and is that you matter deeply to God. So just work glad that you're here with us this morning. Hey, before I start off and jump into our new series, I, I need to give a little bit of confession. I, I just want you to know, like at the kickoff of the new year, I'm fired up. So if you can't understand what I'm saying, it's not because I had 20 cups of coffee. It's just because I'm super pumped. I'm glad that you're here. And we're starting this new series that I think could be life-changing, and it's called Double. And here's the reason that we named this series Double. Because sometimes in life, doesn't it feel like there's two of us? I mean, sometimes as I go through life, I feel like there's two of me. And, and here's what I mean. I'm going to put it on the screen. Sometimes there's the me that I want to be. There's the me that I, it, it's coming, I promise. There's, maybe it won't. Maybe there's a me that I want to be. You know, there's the me that I want to be. And then there's the me that I am. And if I was really honest, the me that I want to be and the me that I am, sometimes they're different. And that got me thinking, sometimes is the me that you want to be, is it different than the you that you actually are? And it got me thinking, has this ever happened to you? The me that I want to be when it, when it comes to my friends is I want to be loyal and I want to be available. But sometimes the me that I am is one who gossips and is distant. You know, the me that I want to be when it comes to my job, I, I want to be known as hardworking and nice, but sometimes the me that I am is a slacker and a jerk face because I'm not always nice. Have you ever thought about, listen, listen, the me I want to be when it, when it comes to my finances, I want to be wise and, and I want to save, right? I want to be wise and I want to save. But sometimes the me that I am, well, I overspend and, and, I, and I don't plan there's the me I want to be as a neighbor, right? I want, to, I, want to be, I want to be friendly, right? And I want to be accessible. But the me that I am is grouchy and avoiding. I mean, I think about it. The me that I want to be when it comes to my health, I want to eat right and I want to exercise, right? But sometimes the me that I am, well, I overeat and I'm a couch potato, I mean, think about it. The me that I want to be when it comes to school, I want to be known as smart and nice. But the me that I am is sometimes one who takes shortcuts, and I prefer to be in a clique. I mean, the me that I want to be when it comes to being a spouse is loyal and helpful. Sometimes the me that I am is absent and selfish. The me that I want to be as a parent is patient and loving. Unfortunately, sometimes the me that I am is aggravated and critical. And it happens to all of us, doesn't it? There's a me that I want to be, and there's a me that I am. It happens to me, it happens to you, it happens to we. It's why at the start of the new year, it's come on, it's why at the start of the new year, we look back at the old year and we go, what didn't we do right? And we go, listen, there's a gap between the me that I wanted to be and the me that I, that I am. And so you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to plan for this future year to, to, to be different. And it leads us to a truth this morning as we start off this new year. And I don't know if it's going to come up on my slide, but, but it's in your insert. Is it going to come up on my slide? Are we going to get my slides? There it is. Sometimes I'm the opposite of the me I want to be. Sometimes I'm the opposite of the me I want to be. Can I get a raise of hands? Are you sometimes the opposite of the you you want to be? And here's, here's the thing. Here's why this problem matters. Here's why this problem matters. Look, look, look up here. Here's why this problem matters. Because no one wants to be known for their shortcomings. No one wants to be known for how wrong they are. We all want to be known for our goodness. 
And listen, regardless of where you are in your faith, whether you have no faith, whether you have different faith, whether you have some faith, listen, each and every single one of us wants to be known for what's right, not what's wrong. I mean, think about this. This is why when you go to the movies, listen, even if you snuck into the movies and didn't pay, even if you went to the movies with someone you weren't supposed to, even if you went to the movies and you brought your own snacks, well, that isn't necessarily wrong because of the prices, maybe, right? <laughs> but listen, when you go to the movies, here's what I know about you. Most of us do not applaud the villain. Instead, we cheer for the hero. You want to know why we do that regardless of where we're at in life? It's because in our life, we don't want to be the villain. In our life, we want to be the hero. And each and every one of us has a me I want to be that we are not yet. So what do we do? So what do we do? You know what we do? Here's what we do. Even church folk, here's what we do. We, we look back to last year. We looked at the future. We said, listen, I'm going to try harder. I'm going to be better. I'm going to make some New Year's resolutions, right? I'm going to plan some goals. And we say, this year will be and it'll be different, it'll be better and different. I promise you this year will be better and different. But I did some research and the facts say that's a bad plan. No, seriously, I did some research. I was in the office and I was doing some research on like New Year's resolutions and goals. And I went to several different resources to kind of get the facts straight. And they said somewhere between 50 to 80% of people quit in the first week of February. 50 to 80%, and you're like, man, that's a lot. And, and, and you go, maybe that's me. But here was the stat that was jaw-dropping. This is the one as I was doing multiple research, I came across a statistic, and I came across it multiple times, and it said this, that only 8% of people that make a goal or resolutions actually accomplish them. Now, I don't know if you're a math major, but if only 8% actually accomplish their goals or the resolutions, that's not a 50% fail rate. Somebody lied. That is a 92% fail rate. And it got me thinking. And then I came up with this idea. I came up with this, like, this idea. I, I really believe, that, listen to this idea. What if the 8% that actually kept their resolutions, what if it wasn't because they were awesome? What if it's the other 92% are aiming at the wrong target? What if... What if aiming at being better? What if aiming at being more moral will never lead to becoming the I I want to be? What if instead of aiming for better or moral, what if instead we chose to aim for integrity and wholeness? Might that lead to the becoming the I I want to be? And if you're pretty smart and you're out there, you're thinking, you're thinking, Matt, isn't morality and integrity the same thing? And I, and I want to say, no, it isn't. Matter of fact, I want to put up a slide of kind of the differences between morality and integrity because I think especially in church world, we get these things confused. We think morality is the same thing as integrity and they're vastly different. See, morality says I need to be better and it's subjective, right? You have your morals, I have my morals, and they're subjective and we kind of make them up. And not only are morals subjectives, morals always have loopholes. If, come on, come on. I know I'm not the only person that does this. Well, this applies most of the time, but it doesn't apply this time, right? There's, there's this reason. There's this excuse. There's this circumstance that says, listen, it's subjective. I have a loophole out of this. Like, you know, I shouldn't pay my taxes because they don't need my money and somebody else will do it. You know, I, I should be able to sneak in because they're a big corporate. Like, sometimes it's subjective and there's loopholes. And more, uh, morality always has to do with our outside actions, how I look on the outside. And lastly, morality is always about behavior modification. It's always about changing my behavior, whereas integrity has a little bit of a different thing. It's about being whole. Let me, I want to take a little quick survey. How many of you have ever flown on an airplane? Raise your hand, right? Okay, good. And for those of you that have never flown on an airplane, how many of you rode in a car? Okay, everyone should raise your hand because you got here today. See, the idea of an airplane is, is that it needs to have integrity. An airplane doesn't have moralities. An airplane has integrity, which means it is whole. It means
means that when there's pressure and when things come against it, it will withstand the pressure and it will get you to where you need to go and it won't break down and crack. There's a difference between being better and being whole. See, when you have integrity, your morals or your principles, they're unmoving. They don't change. They are principles, which means one thing applies to multiple things. Like, you know, Jesus says, so in everything do unto others as you would have them do. You know, that applies to everything. Because everything means everything. It's unmoving. It's principled. Integrity has to do as much with the inside as it does with the outside. Matter of fact, Jesus continually spoke to people and said, listen, it's just not your outward actions. It's what goes on in the heart because the heart will always reveal itself in some kind of action. And lastly, integrity isn't just about behavior modification. It's about heart change. What if... Becoming the me I want to be is about having integrity. What if that will lead us to becoming the who that we want to be? Now, I have a confession this morning, and so I need, I need everyone to lean in. I need, I need you to look and listen. And, and I would say, listen, this is a pretty important confession. And the confession goes something like this. At times, at times, the modern church has not helped people become the me that they want to be. Matter of fact, if we are really honest, for whatever reason, sometimes churches forget that they're supposed to be a safe place where people can admit their struggles and then take steps to get better. For whatever reason, and I don't know the reason, but sometimes in modern churches, it's become a place where we show up and we try to look good. It's like church has become a morality fashion show and we show up and try to show each other up on how good I am and how righteous I am. And I don't know if that's what the church was meant to be, a morality fashion show. Now, I'm about to make a statement that, you know, if I was really honest, is not only dangerous, it may offend you. See, here's the thing. Church isn't meant to make good citizens. Okay, see, I knew some of you wouldn't like that. Church isn't meant to make good citizens. The church is meant to transform lives in a way that honors Jesus. See, there's a big difference. Church isn't meant to make good citizens to be a morality fashion show. It's meant to create life change in a way that honors Jesus. And matter of fact, this is why it makes this is why it's so crazy. This is why you would go, wow. Because matter of fact, one of the most influential followers of Jesus actually addresses the very issue of sometimes I'm the opposite of the me I want to be. Matter of fact, he writes this. We're going to put it on the screen. Here, here's his words. He's running to a church in Rome. That's why it's called Romans. There's a group of people, and they're made up of some Jewish people, some, some heathens, and there's a, a whole different group, men, women, children. It's a, it's a church kind of a lot like this, just all different kinds of people, all different kinds of backgrounds. And here's what he writes. So the trouble's not with the law, for it is spiritual and good. That's why you know, that's why I know, that's why when we go to the movies, we always cheer for the hero. That's why there's a me I want to be, because we know that at the end, Right isn't wrong, and that being right is something worth attaining. It says the trouble is with, the trouble isn't with the thing that I'm aiming at. The trouble is with me. For I am all too human. I'm a slave to sin. A little bit later, he says, I don't really understand myself. Can I get an amen? Let, let, let me repeat that, because some of the, this, this might be eye-opening. He says, I really don't understand myself. For I want to do what's right, but I don't do it. Amen. That's good news. Have you ever been in that boat? I wanted to do what's right, but I just messed it up. I didn't mean to cuss, but I did. I didn't mean to yell at my children, but I did. I know in the parking lot after Christmas service, I shouldn't have flipped them off, but it came out. If that's you, we forgive you and love you, and welcome back to South Point. Instead, listen to what the author says. I do what I... Can anyone relate to this? The author doesn't finish. He keeps, continues to go. He says this, And I know that nothing good lives in me. That is in my sinful nature. I want to do what's right, but I can't. And what he's saying is sometimes I'm the opposite of the me I want to be. And the author a little bit later concludes this, and he says, I want to do what is good, but I don't. And I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. Can I get it? Amen. I mean, this person has said basically the same thing about eight different times. And then the author concludes by saying this, I have discovered this principle in life. Now I want to stop. When the Bible says, and an author that God has used to speak says, I've discovered a principle in life, we should listen. 
And here's what the author says, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is. I love God's law with all my heart. But there's another power within me that is war in the mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. It gets to the point where he realizes, listen, there's a me I want to be and there's a me I am and there's a big gap and I can't seem to bridge the gap between the me that I am and the me that I want to be. Who will free me? Now this is really important because he didn't say what will free me. He didn't say what politics will free me. He didn't say what economics will free me. He didn't say what education will free me. He didn't say what pleasure will free me. He said who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death. Now, who is this author in the scriptures that God uses to speak to you and I? So this church in Rome, who is this person that struggles with what we struggle with? That sometimes I'm the opposite of the me that I want to be. It's none other than the Apostle Paul. I mean, think about it. He was the first church planter. And not only did he plant one church, he planted a lot of churches. And not only plant a lot of churches, he, he encountered a risen, he saw Jesus face to face, risen from the dead. God showed up to him personally. Not only did he, was he a church planter, not only did Jesus show up to him personally face to face, he wrote over a quarter of the New Testament. God used him miraculously, and yet he says, what a miserable person I am. Sometimes I'm not the me I want to be. And when churches, when churches become morality fashion shows, and we don't admit this truth, there are three lies that we can believe. And if we believe these three lies, they can cause a ton of, of damage, a ton of damage all throughout our life. So this morning I want to address kind of these three lies briefly that you and I can believe when church becomes a morality fashion show instead of a safe place to admit our struggles and be able to take our next steps so that we can become who God intended us to be. The first lie that we believe, and I bet everyone in this room at some point has believed this. We believe this lie. I'm alone in this. Can I get a smile? Anyone out there smile? Anybody watching? Can you smile right? I'm alone in this. And here, here's what happens is there's an area that you're not good at. There's an area that you fail in. There's a me you want to be, but then there's the, the you that you are, and they don't match. And you just go, man, I must be the only person. Because listen, I looked at Instagram. I looked at Facebook. I've gone to church, man, those people look happy. They look together. I must be the only person struggling with my finances. I must be alone and the only person struggling in my marriage. I must be alone in this. I must be the only person struggling in my career because everyone else seems to be doing so much better. I mean, look at all the smiles and look, look at all the, the fashion show of how great I am when we're together. Man, I'm alone in my struggle in my relationships. I'm alone in my struggle in my parenting. Because look at everyone else, it's going so great for them. And here's why I'm alone in this, believing this lie is so destructive, is because when you're alone, you can't go get help. You can't go get support. When you're alone, where do you get advice and help and encouragement? Even if you're surrounded by people, I bet each and every one of us has shown up to a church on a Sunday where we need someone to pray with us, where we need to say, listen, I need to get some help. But we were alone even though we were surrounded by crowds of people. We do it with our families. We do it on the job place. We go, I'm alone in this. And I've, I've been guilty of this. I've been guilty of this. Matter of fact, um, several years ago, and it's been quite a few years ago, I, I got really sick um, while I was leading the church. And, and it was a physical illness that lasted for a couple years. And, and because of that, and because of the stress, and because of some things in my life, my workaholism, uh, my drivenness, um, I just ran into a depression uh, that lasted for a couple of years. And, and, you know, it was just really hard. And I, I wasn't really honest with a lot of people around me. I said, I had to lead the church. I'm the guy that has to be fired up on Sunday morning. I have to encourage people. And so in my depression, and 
and in my pain, I felt very alone. And by the way, this is just, just something for church folk, okay? Listen, when it comes to mental health, it is not a spiritual issue. It is a physical issue. Can I just get an amen? Let's, let's just go. We can address that and love people and stop telling them to pray more and actually get them some help that they need. Okay, that's a sidebar. We're done with that, okay? But I was alone in this until I came across this book, and this book was called Leading on Empty. And it was written by a pastor that I kind of looked up to. And the pastor told a story of leading the church, but he was driven like me, and he had some workaholic tendencies like me. And then he, then he crashed, and just things didn't work, and, and, and just couldn't keep life together. And when I read this book, I finally said, I am not. There, there's other people like me. And when I realized and was willing to admit that I need to get help, I could go get help. And I'm so thankful because I'm still here today. And it got me thinking, have you believed the lie that you're alone in this? Man, I'm the only person that's messed up my finances. Man, I'm, I'm the only person who, who got into a relationship, man, I, I didn't know it'd be like this. I'm the only person whose marriage is struggling. I'm the only mom who wishes I wasn't a mom because those kids drive me crazy. All you have to do is go to a mom's group. They'll tell you the truth. I'm the only person who has this flaw and I keep messing up my relationships. And as long as you continue to believe the lie that you're alone, you'll never ever be willing to admit and get some help. And here's the thing, this lie actually leads into the second lie, which is so dangerous. And here's the second lie, we're going to put it up. I'm more broken than others. Right? Listen, when you and I have a limited view, when you and I can't see and other people don't admit that they're broken or that they have areas of struggles or that they're in progress, we go, listen, I'm not only alone, but they look like they're doing so good. I must be more broken than them. God must not like me. God must be against me. I must be more defective than other people. And my limited view of seeing that other people struggle too and that I'm alone leads me to believe, well, listen, there's something wrong with me. I'm more broken. And here's the problem when we believe this lie. It starts a cycle of shame and rationalization. When I believe that I'm more broken, it creates the shame in the midst of our heart. And when you have shame, that's a bad feeling. So we medicate it. We usually don't medicate it with good things. We medicate it with bad things. And then we feel shameful for medicating our lives. And we feel more shame and I'm more broken than other people. And so I go back and I repeat and I get stuck in a vicious cycle. But it gets worse. When I believe that I'm more broken than others, you know what I do? I will justify or I'll rationalize, well, I'll, it's okay, I get to do that because I'm broken. It's okay that I do that because I'm broken. And you should put up with my stuff and I should have consequences in my life because I'm broken and so it's okay for me to do the thing that continues to hurt you, me, and everyone around me in my life. And if you don't believe me, this is, I can't tell you the number of people that I've run into, that I've sat down and have conversations with. Matter of fact, I had this, this one person, I was sitting there, I was having this conversation. They said, you don't understand, Pastor Matt. I'm more broken than other people. Like this thing that's broken in my life, no one else deals with. And, and I just struggle. I'm tempted more. I, I can't, like, you don't understand. Like, I can't bear this. And I go, I just don't like saying, you know, listen, all the struggle. And I continue to tell this person, listen, you are not alone. I told, shared some of my struggles. I said, listen, I know for a fact as a pastor, why I can't tell other people's struggles, I can tell you that every single person in this room has something that they struggle with. That we have areas to mature and to grow in. That there are areas that we want to be that we're not yet. And they wouldn't believe me. And here's the problem. When you live in shame and rationalization, you will continue to do the thing that leads to brokenness and it will cause dysfunction, devastating dysfunction in your life if you believe I'm more broken than others. Which leads us into the third lie that we believe. I'm stuck again. Can I get an amen? Okay, two of you, that's great. I'm not going to ask that question again. Okay, I'm stuck again, so I should give up, right? I mean, how many of us have ever said, listen, I don't want to do this, and then we do it, and we say, I'm going to try really, really hard, and you make it a little bit, and then you do it again, and you go, oh, I'm, you know, I'm like this, and, and then you do it again, and then eventually here's what happens is when you get stuck, the pain of failure, the pain of failure leads you to believe that you should give up. And that is the worst lie to believe. Listen, when I was a young person and a young guy, I thought failure was the worst thing in life. 
And you know what I've discovered as the older I've got? There's something worse than failure. Giving up is worse than failure. See, if you fail and you pick yourself back up, you can continue to move forward. It's not how many times you failed, it's are you in progress? Listen, we're all, listen, 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 come on, listen. You're not going to like this, but this is true because Jesus said it. Listen, in this world, you'll have trouble. Listen, all of us are going to run into patches where life doesn't go, where we fail, where we make mistakes. There are no perfect people. And if you think you're one, this is probably not a good place for you. Right? But listen, when you get stuck and you decide, listen, I'm going to give up, you move from living to existing. And no one is meant to exist. You are meant to live. I mean, think about it. My kids are a little bit older. My kids are 17 and 18. But when my daughters were little, they would try to walk. And both my daughters are tall for being females. And so as they were growing, they, sh they shot up pretty fast. And so walking, they came a little bit later in life because they were always falling. They, they crawled. They, they did all the things. But as they walked, they were always falling and stumbling. And they were a little bit clumsy. But you know what I noticed? After the first time they fell, they didn't quit. After the second time they fell, they didn't quit. After the third time they failed, they didn't quit because they realized that there's something worse than failure. It's giving up. And if you and I buy into lie number three, well, I'm stuck again, so I should give up. We lose out on life because we just go into existence mode and not living mode. These three lies are devastating. They carry lifelong generational consequences, and no one in this room or watching or listening should believe that you are alone or that you're more broken or because you're stuck, you should give up. Matter of fact, this author, the Apostle Paul, when he shares the truth that sometimes I'm the opposite of the me I want to be, he doesn't end with failure and he doesn't end with frustration. Here's what he says. He says, who will rescue me from this miserable, wretched person I am? And we pick it up and we're going to go back. I think there's one more slide before that we change it? Because it says, thanks be to Jesus. I'm going to look it up right here in my scripture here because I want to make sure that I get it right, but it's in Romans. And I don't know if it got on there, but it says right before, right before, so now there is, in uh, Romans 7, 25, it says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. He says, listen, who will rescue me? Jesus does something that you and I can't do. And then it goes on to say, so now there is what? No, what's that word? I looked up what condemnation meant in the dictionary because, you know, I kind of know what it means and I can kind of feel it when people say condemnation. I know what condemnation feels like. But when you try to explain the word condemnation, it can, it can be really hard to explain. And condemnation can mean blame, but it really comes in in a judicial sense in the sense that when you are condemned, it means you're guilty. It means the me I want to be and the me that I am, the gap in between means that you're guilty, I'm guilty, and we're all guilty. But there's great news because of Jesus there's no condemnation. There's no guilt. That gap between the me I want to be and the me that God made me to be and the me that I am, great news. Jesus paid the price for the peace that is missing. You should be fired up at the start of the year. There's no condemnation for those who belong to Jesus. Listen, it doesn't say belong to a political party. Can I get an amen? It doesn't say belong to the right country, speak to the right language, have enough money in their bank accounts, have enough talent. It says belong to a person named Jesus, not to a pastor, a church, a religion, an organization, but a person. See, if you belong to Jesus, that gap between who you are and who you want to be is made up in Jesus. Now, why is that so important? And here's the whole crux of what I couldn't wait to get to. Here's why it's so important. We're going to put it up on the screen. And it's... Oh, there it is. <laughs> and because you belong to him, the power of the life of the Spirit has freed you from the power that leads to death. But here's the principle we're going to get to that's just extra and free. Jesus provides a necessary grace so we can pursue integrity and not morality. See, here's the great thing. Because Jesus covered the gap, because there's no condemnation or guilt, you and I don't have to pursue morality. This doesn't have to be a morality fashion show to show others and God how good you are. You and I don't have to pursue that. You and I can pursue wholeness. We can pursue integrity. As I kind of land the plane, there's this encounter with Jesus. 
And it's kind of this weird encounter. It's an encounter with ten lepers. And I think the ten lepers represent something pretty amazing. Because back in the day of Jesus, leprosy meant that you were removed from your family, you were removed from your community, you were removed from your career, and you were isolated into a group of other people who were lepers. And so you had a new family and you were ostracized from everything that you knew. The me you wanted to be wasn't an option. And there was a large gap between the me I wanted to be and the me that I am when I had leprosy. And these 10 lepers heard about Jesus. And they showed up to Jesus that, Jesus, we've heard that you can fill the gap between the me that I want to be and the me that I am. And Jesus says, you're right. And Jesus says, hey, listen, go show yourselves to the priest. And on their way, as they go show themselves to the priest, all 10 lepers get healed. They're amazed. And we pick up the story here. One comes back and Jesus asks, we're not all 10 cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise, go, your faith has made you well. Now, I want to stop there. He's already healed. He's already healed. He's already healed. Yet Jesus says, your faith has made you whole, whole, go your way, you are well. And see, here's the difference. Here's a principle that Jesus is teaching us in this moment. There's a difference between being better and being well. And at church, we need to stop being a place where we try to get well. We need to try to be people who are well and get whole. Because we've come to Jesus, who wants more for us than just get better. He wants us to be well. So it leaves us asking a pretty important question. Matter of fact, I want to ask you this question. What are you going to pursue this year? I mean, what is it that you're going to pursue? What is it that you're going to pursue to become the you that you want to be? Are you going to pursue love? Are you going to pursue success, money, pleasure, fame? What is it that you're going to pursue to become the you that you want to be? or the one that God made you to be? And the real question that we need to answer or ask is, is whatever we're pursuing gonna actually help us become the me I wanna be? And so here's my only step that I want you to take. Come back next week as we continue this series and invite a friend, as we continue our series double, so that we can do more than just have a morality fashion show that instead of seeking morality or being better, we can seek integrity and be whole so that through Christ we can become what we were meant to be. Hey, let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for the honesty of Scripture. Here's the Apostle Paul who had an amazing life and who you used dramatically to influence the world in history. And yet he admits this truth that sometimes he was the opposite of the me that he wanted to be. But there's hope. There's hope in a person named Jesus. That we don't have to aim for being better. We don't have to aim for morality. That because you covered that gap, that we can pursue becoming whole in you. God, give us wisdom. Give us grace. Help none of us here in this room believe any of those lies, that we are alone, that we're more broken, or that because we're stuck, we should give up. May we realize and know that there is hope and grace found in Jesus. This is our prayer. In your name we pray. Amen. If you're ready to take the next step in your spiritual journey or continue to support South Point, you can connect to a small group, serve on a team, and give financially by clicking the box on the right. To watch other sermons from South Point Church, click the playlist on the left. Click the logo to subscribe.